Welcome to our first session of Dungeons & Dragons. Something I like to call Prime Arcana. The beginning of the Scourge Garden saga. This is Session Zero, Frost. Welcome to the world of Zorizon. Specifically, a continent known as the Fairlands. Many tales on this world have already been told. Even more remain unknown, seen only by the eyes of the gods. This tale, in particular, is a story about what it truly means to be cold. We find ourselves now in the southeastern region of the Fairlands, otherwise known for the last 2,221 years as the Scourge Garden. The Scourge Garden stretches out before the Lone Wanderer, like a frozen expanse of desolation, an arctic wasteland where winds howl like mournful spirits and the worst of the cold cuts through flesh and bone. The snow-covered plains, forests, and crystal mountains are treacherous, hiding crevasses that could swallow an unwary traveler in an instant. The land is dotted with sparse patches of hardy vegetation, gnarled shrubs and frost-touched grasses that somehow cling to life in this unforgiving climate. Small, hardy animals dart between the rocks and snow, their coats thick and white to blend in with their surroundings. The occasional howl of a distant predator echoes through the icy stillness, a reminder that life here is a constant struggle for survival. Above the man's head, the sky is alive with the vibrant colors of the Shiver Vale Borealis. Waves of green, purple, and pink light dance across the heavens, casting a surreal luminescence over the snow-covered ground he stalks. At the top of a hill, he pauses to catch his breath and take in the stunning display. Hot breath steams in the frigid air as you stand motionless, transfixed by the celestial spectacle above. Steve, please describe your character for the first time. Yeah, so Skogel is a half frost giant, half elf, Goliath, and he has made it his whole life to sort of make himself seem bigger than he is because of his short stature among the giant community. He um, He's covered in leathers that seem to pile up and sort of indicate that he is hiding mass, that you can't really tell how big he is, but he seems nice and furry, nice and thick. He's got crystal blue eyes that sort of reflect the shiver veil. When he kind of like looks out across the horizon, there, there's like pinpricks of uh, glinting light in his eyes because his, uh, his blue eyes seem like gems, almost like the white watchers. He has a Scandinavian sort of feel to him. Almost like when you're looking at a Viking uh, in the eyes, they, they tend to they tend to have a disconcerting effect on you. You're low on food supplies, and you, the cold does nothing to chill your already blue skin, but your breath still forms clouds in the frigid air. Down in a valley, roughly a mile away, a herd of caribou grazes, their thick coats blending seamlessly with the snow-dappled landscape. Their breath, too, rises in small clouds, mingling with the frosty air. Crouching low, your keen eyes assess the situation, calculating the best approach. The caribou remain unaware of your presence, their focus instead on the sparse vegetation of their late afternoon meal. Um, he sees the caribou and he's trying to assess um, which might be the, the prime shot, which is the weakest link. Okay. Let's go ahead then and have you roll a survival for me to track this herd. Um, okay, let's try it. Ten? Okay. So, because it's such a big herd, I would say that, like, it's definitely very easy for you to track them as they're moving across this plane towards that, like, you know, sort of, like, forest beyond. But at this point, they are too far for you to hit them, even with a longbow. All right. Uh, he's definitely going to stalk 
um, stalk him and stay downwind and do all his ranger goodness. Okay, roll me a stealth check. So, he... So you drop to one knee and, like, find, you know, stability on the uneven, like, snowy ground as you sort of get up behind this, like, hill of snow and there's some, like, brush and debris around you and ready out your bow and notch the arrow and your eyes kind of lock on to this one target, which is, like, a large male. He's got this big proud set of antlers, but you can see that, like, he's limping a bit. Like, uh, as you draw back the bowstrings and hold your breath and steady yourself, and, like, the world kind of, like, narrows into this, like, single point of just your aim. Are there any moments from your past that filter through your mind as you stare down your prey? Yeah, um, when you mentioned that he has a limp, yeah, I think he's, he's uh, getting some flashbacks of uh, when he might have been injured and uh, how the clan treated him, treated him with injury and it wasn't with kindness. And he's kind of using that to power his, his, uh, his rage, um, his, uh, his necessity at this point. It's not really rage yet. I would say go ahead and roll a stealth attack. And that's going to say, so 18. So stealth for your skills is an 8. So that would make this a 26. Oh, I see. Okay. So very much a successful hit. Because the caribou's AC was a 12. So you very much hit it. And how much damage did you do? 9? Mm-hmm. Nine okay. piercing. So it's very much still alive. So the arrow flies true, and it like hits the, the caribou squarely on the side, and it lets out this pain scream that terrifies and you know startles the rest of the herd who s- sprint off in all different directions. And kind of like most of them head off in like one direction, but some of them all kind of spread off wildly. The wounded one bolts away from you, running r- roughly 100 yards before sort of like collapsing into the snow. And... Uh, its powerful body thrashes and it's like laying there. The rest of the herd, like startled by the commotion, scatters, disappearing across the frozen lake. And like, it's still alive, but you can see from a distance that it's like breathing heavily and like it's got the the arrow in its side and then it like pushes itself up and it like gets up and it's like walking across the ice lake. And does it know where the arrow came from and who shot it or anything or am I still in stealth? All right, I will roll a perception for the caribou since you asked. It has a plus three perception. Let's see what we get. It does wow. see. It does see you. Yes, it does see you. Okay. Um, so when it sees you, you know it starts to froth a little bit at the mouth, and it like stamps its foot on the ice, and like tilts its head down like to like, buck sort of at you with like its antlers, and uh, charges. Roll initiative. Um, that's fun. You got higher, so you go first. Okay. He levels the longbow at the uh, caribou's chest again, and he got a 16. So 16, it, you needed a 12 to hit because that's its AC. So go ahead and roll that damage. Seven piercing. All right. You hit it again with the arrow. It is not dead yet. So it, Jeez, it, I cool. know. <laughs> it had 22 hit points. This thing must be uh, like bigger than a regular caribou then. It's like a dire, it's like a dire caribou. Yeah, a dire caribou, that's yeah, a great way exactly. to say it, yeah. So as it reaches you, it's gonna try to gore you because it's already oh, yeah. it's already trying to like run at you. Oh yeah. All right, so it rolled a 19, so it did hit. So that is gonna be a, okay. So it must've rolled a two. So yeah, you take four damage. It is now your turn, and it is now close enough. Like you guys are like right up on each other. And th- right, this me. he comes down on it with uh, he whips out his short sword and, and comes down on it. On well, its neck. that's absolutely a success. Go ahead and roll that damage. Yeah, it's dead. So go ahead and describe how you uh, how you kill this caribou. Yeah. So once he takes the damage, um, he he just says, "Well met," and then he brings the short sword down and he goes. May the hereafter be more kind. And he, he chops into his neck. The beast, you know, lays there and takes one last breath as the steam, and you know, spills out into the cold air and the blood spills out around its uh, 
its head onto the cold ice as Skogel kind of like falls backwards on his butt. You know, he'd been like tracking this herd for probably about like six or seven hours. It's been a long day. I mean, it's probably like mid afternoon right now, you know? So like after seeing this and getting such a big buck, like that's kind of a big win for him. So like, what's he feeling right now what's he thinking like what's he saying and or doing as he's looking down at this this hall is he is he how how would he prepare this corpse to to you know carry it back to his uh his camp yeah i guess how far away is the camp uh i mean it would definitely be probably like a two-hour walk um and how and how big is this caribou do you know how much it weighs the caribou is i'm gonna say 400 pounds so what is your strength 16 could carry up to 230 pounds oh okay how much weight are you currently rocking right now it looks like it's 147 so you can carry basically like another like 80 pounds of meat okay. that means that you have to basically fucking field dress field dress this bitch like on the ice here he basically just delimbs the creature um, he'll carve out um, haunches and um, shoulder muscles, things like that. But yeah, he's not he's not taking care. He's basically just um, conserving all or as much of the lean protein as he can. I mean, what's really great about it being in the frost environment is he can do this, you know, as, as slow as he wants. Absolutely. Go ahead and roll a perception for me, though. All right. Oh, well, that's not something. good. Uh, your perception bonus is a three, it looks like, so that's a seven. Okay, so that's a fail. As you're so focused on securing this meat, you know, cutting off the haunches and going after these limbs, you fail to notice the three ice wolves that have been watching you from the edge of the tree line. Their hungry eyes fixate on such a fresh kill and such little defense. Driven by hunger and opportunity, the wolves make their move. Without warning, you hear the rapid crunching of snow and the growl of the wolves closing in. They are fast and coordinated, each one angling to flank and overwhelm you. Roll an initiative for me. Oh boy. Is higher initiative or lower initiative better in, in this one? Higher. Skogel's got a nine, the wolves got 10, 14, 13. Okay, so all the wolves attack. That's going to be one, two, three. What's your AC 16? Mm -hmm. None of them fucking bite you. Wait, so are, are they ice fortified like I am? They are two regular winter wolves and a dire wolf. Okay, so, all right. I have an idea. Yeah, so after he dodges their initial attacks, uh, Skogel takes a step back and he, he shouts at the top of his lungs. He's just like, wait. And then um, he takes his axe and he holds it into the uh, he holds it in the air, and and he slams it in the ice. Go ahead and roll an intimidation check for me. Or you know what? Instead of wait, he goes hold. Intimidation, charisma, intelligence. Oh, cool. There's oh no, that was an investigation. Oh wow, that one. Good boy. <laughs> so <laughs> when he fucking does that, when he like slams his axe down to the ice and he puts his hand up and he's like hold. Like all the wolves, like kind of like look at him, and then like they just attack immediately. Um, yeah, so I mean, I definitely just attacked the ice, though. So even though he failed the intimidation, go ahead and roll roll your damage for 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 that, or because it's an automatic hit. So roll the attack, and then we'll just hit the attack button. Okay, got it. So hand yeah. axe, and then that's nine. Okay, so go ahead and roll. I'm gonna say, go ahead and roll a survival for me. Okay, so when you do that, the ice beneath your feet shatters and like you drop right down into the fucking water. It doesn't affect you at all in any way because the cold water doesn't hurt you. Your hand is still on the hand axe, so you still have a grip, but all the wolves are still on the ground. So um, are they trying to attack the ice hole since it's their turn now? Or? No, like they all completely ignore the ice hole and all just start immediately attacking and eating the body of the caribou like once you're in the water it takes them like five or six seconds but they pretty quickly start eating up all the stuff you've carved and start trying to eat as much as they can as the caribou 
you've now been down there at this point for about two seconds, two, three. No, no, no. It's probably like five, six, seven seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, they exited initiative, which means I exited initiative, right? Yes. All right. Now I like the sound of that. So um, are they strictly focused on the caribou at this point? They are. All right. Uh, I'd like to come out of the hole and try for an attack of opportunity. Go for it. Okay, so I guess that's a stealth roll just to get out of the hole, or does absolutely it stealth roll for sure because they're wolves because they got good hearing. Yep, stealth eighteen. So as you climb up out of the water, two of the wolves have their faces buried too deeply into the caribou, just like gnawing away at this thing's entrails to really notice you. But one of them, who is sort of clearly like the uh, the lower caste wolf of the three like had an eye, you know, partially on the water and like does see you come up out of the water. Okay. Um, Thus, we must roll initiative again. Between those two, right? Just you and that one. Okay, so you go first. All right, I'm long bowing into one of his boys. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, so they have a 13 armor class. That's a miss. So as you uh, come up out of the water and like go to like grab one of your arrows and like stick it into the bow to notch it it's just like too wet so it kind of like slips between your fingers and like sparks off of the ice and um this first one is gonna leap forward to, the first one who sees you is gonna leap forward to attack you jesus 22 that that's a hit so that that one is gonna it's gonna be seven damage holy shit how much hit points do you have left <laughs> three okay so now I have to make to sure that the others, I have to roll perception for these other two to see if they even see you. Like if they even are aware of this fight that's happening or if they're, oh yeah, the first one does. The second one is being greedy as fuck though. So it is now your turn, but two of them are looking at you and one yeah. of them just bit you. Damn. Yeah, so um, I guess as the one looks at him, he's just like, holy, like he like takes a look at the bite that they just got carved out of him. And he's just like, <sighs> and he just dives into the hole. And as he dives into the hole and the uh, the wounds and the cold water and the, the thrush of the river moving him beneath it takes over, the last sort of thing that you're really aware of before passing out is the howls of the wolves as they like claim their prize from you. His darkness sort of just encroaches at the edge of your vision. Like you hold your breath for as long as you can, but eventually it, it definitely kind of takes you. You wake up with a start, heart pounding in your chest. Blinking rapidly, you take in your surroundings. You're inside a small woodshed, lying on a simple cot, your armor and weapons neatly set aside, your wounds have been bandaged, and a faint warmth radiates from a small stove in the corner. What is Skogel thinking and or feeling right now as he looks around this little woodshed? He's, he's just, he's shocked that he's not looking at the sky, um, and I guess he's relieved that he isn't looking at the afterlife. To your left, there's a whole wall of, like, uh, chopped wood. Like, this is, like, where someone keeps their uh, wood for the deepest of deep winters. Like, this is, it's like a, they keep their wood dry. So, like, all of the chopped wood is dry, and it's, like, running along one whole wall. And then in the corner down by your feet, there's a little lantern that is, like, keeping the room warm. And then you're laying on a cot, and, like, your armor and weapons are, like, all folded and stuffed up, like on top of the stack of lumber, basically. And then there's a door next to you, but no window. Yeah, so that means someone put him there. Okay. Um, yeah, he just he stands uh, as silently as he can. He actually doesn't want to alert anyone to him having regained consciousness. I mean, his general perception is that he is safe, right? Roll a uh, survival for me. He's pretty, pretty... Uh, I mean, like, obviously... This room, he, he does not see any traps. It doesn't see like it's a dangerous room. Um, I would leave the rest of it up to you to decide like how he personally feels about the situation. But there's nothing that he can see in this moment right now that That's would concern him. 
Um, in terms of his hit points, uh, did he get restored? You or? have had a long rest. You're back at full. Okay, so... All right. Um, yeah, I guess... Knowing that someone is clearly taking care of him and their shit, his shit is still there. He doesn't see anything missing. He, yeah, he just, he finds his way uh, out of the shed to see what the hell he can see. How, how do you open the door? Like, how do you go out? Like, how do you step out? Well, I think as a ranger, he probably would always just always put his equipment on first. Um, so he's going to put on everything he's got with the expectation that perhaps whatever's behind that door is something that, was just waiting for him to be a nice, fat, juicy toy for him. So he's he when he opens the door, he does it with, with a deep sense of caution and stealth. As you open the door, the morning sun crests the Dyerfell mountain range in the distance to cast a glow over the landscape. Roll a perception for me. Okay. So to the north, across the yard, if you could call it that, with its gnarled tree stumps and unfinished gardens, is a cozy-looking cabin. Standing just out front of the doorway is an owlin sipping a cup of hot tea. He stands at a modest five feet tall, and his feathers are a mix of earthy browns and snowy whites. You see that his face is framed by a pair of large, expressive eyes behind a pair of round spectacles that rest delicately on his beak. Both his left arm and wing are missing, though the talons on his hand holding the mug are clearly very sharp. Leather straps across his chest hold various pouches. A finely made dagger, though not his primary weapon, that's mace, hangs from his belt. Only moments later from your east, a very large yeti appears, roughly two feet taller than you, effortlessly carrying a knocked down tree trunk on one massive shoulder. The yeti's fur is a pristine white, blending almost seamlessly with the snow. As he walks by, he gives you an appraising look before dropping the tree in a stack and continuing on back into the forest. The Owlin says, Hello, giant. You're not going to kill us, I hope. So the Yeti is... Do these things speak? Go ahead and roll a history check for me to see if you know anything about uh, Yetis. Uh, history? That's a new one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, I would say that from your experience, you would have heard tales. You never actually met a Yeti in person. Uh, but you've heard tales that know that they do not speak. They, they, uh, you don't know how they communicate, but they don't speak. You've heard. Okay. And then uh, can you repeat the question he asked? Hello, giant. You're not going to kill us, I hope. And we don't often make habits of um, killing those that help. Oh, good to know. I trust you are feeling somewhat restores, restored. You are fortunate to be alive. I would say so. Frostclaw found you on the shore of our pond early this morning in quite dire state. He brought you here for me to heal you. I, I did what I could. And why? And why? Why did I heal you? Well, that's who I am. <laughs> I'm Orlin Ross. Healer and speaker of the trees. And he, like, waves his, like, remaining arm out, like, towards the forest. My job is to help where I find it. Did I do the wrong thing? I think you know that um, frost giants, we aren't uh, so receptive to help. So what made you think it was safe to help me? And he smiles and, like, looks down at his missing arm and he goes... A frost giant took my ability to fly. I'm very well aware of the violence of your species. It wasn't me that saved you. I told you it was Frostclaw. I did it for him. And he looks over at the Yeti. I've only heard tales of these, but um, I owe you both a debt. If you'd fancy a warm belly, I've got a hot stew inside. If not... I'd appreciate if you'd quietly be on your way. And uh, without waiting for you to respond, Orlin turns around and enters the door to his cabin, which, seemingly to accommodate for Frostclaw, thankfully has a door large enough for you to walk through comfortably. So go ahead and roll your survival here for me to gauge your starvation. Yeah, you're fucking hungry. Yeah, I mean, he'll follow him and, and uh, get, some of that, get some of that food. All right. 
So you feel a growl in your stomach when Orlin mentions the stew and the whole kind of exhaustion and hunger from how that hunt turned out hits you all at once as the adrenaline drops and you feel the pain start to kind of come in from all of those bites. The inside of the cabin is cozy and inviting. It's clear that someone has lived here for a few years at least. The walls are lined with shelves with jars of herbs and bundles of dried plants and a collection of carefully arranged gardening tools. A warm fire crackles in the stone hearth, casting a glow across the room. A large bubbling pot hangs over the flames and a rich aroma of rabbit fills the air. Welcome to the home of the world's worst healer. (laughs) Excuse the clutter. Orlin gestures to a particularly large and crudely made chair near the fire. Please sit. I will fetch a bowl. Scobo laughs as he sits down and he goes, the world's worst healer just found the world's worst ranger. He chuckles. He goes, how long have you been ranging? I'd say nigh 50 years. So tell me, giant, how did you come to be this far into the Evergloom? And he like hands you a bowl. Few of your kind venture this deep away from the mountains on their own. I was under the impression that your people mostly ranged the plains to the north. There are no mammoths down here. You could say that I'm the fewest of my kind. He just kind of like nods and like sits back into his chair and like leans back and like lets the silence sort of overtake the room as he like sips his tea. Your bowl of stew is like sitting there on the table before you. And so has uh, has Orlin actually eaten any of the stew yet? Not that you've seen. Okay. Um, yeah, his ranger instincts are kicking in, and he's not going to eat until Orlin eats something. But instead, I've never seen a Yeti, and yet with an Alan, you two communicate? We communicate as well as we can. He's not like other Yetis you might encounter in these lands. He is wise in ways few can understand, and his strength is matched only by his kindness. It sounds like a good companion for an injured bird. He keeps me safe, and I keep him fed. It's a good deal. Speaking of food, you wouldn't have your stew? Well, I had some this morning. Why are you not hungry? Does it not look appealing to you? Hunger has nothing to do with it. Ah, trust then. <laughs> a pessimist. Healing you and welcoming you into my home isn't enough. All right. And he like leans forward and like picks up the spoon and like piece of the, you know, dips it into the bowl and lifts it up to his beak and drinks it down, puts it back and sits back in his chair and he goes, is that good enough for you? Um, yeah, he just he just starts like s- slamming that soup, like just, just like eating it so hard. And he goes, you'll have to forgive me where I come from. Trust doesn't come easy. <laughs> it's okay. Slow down. <laughs> There's more where that came from. <laughs> he, he kind of looks around the spot and he goes, so how does the how does the worst um, healer in the world come to come to be here? Well, it's quite a long story, but since you're eating the stew, I came from the Fairlands. I was a druid there in the Order of the Verdant Vale. <laughs> Young and ambitious, I believed that magic we wielded would restore the Scored Garden. <laughs> so I came here in my hubris like a fool and he like kind of turns a little bit rueful in his expression as he looks into the fire and he goes ten years on I craft healing salves to trade with passing merchants for alcohol and rumors from the outside world oh there is no magic left here Um, have you seen this magic that you refer to I grew up with it. The Fairlands is a wellspring of it. Yeah, so he's quite confused. Magic is kind of a rumor to them. Something you sought but never found. And he suddenly has a sense of curiosity that this is the kind of thing that got him in trouble. He's like thinking about this and he's going, what evidence of magic do you have? I can give you nothing now, but in my youth, As a druid, I would speak to the animals. I would ride across vines through the sky. I could manipulate trees into portals and step through to other land. There's many things I could do. 
granted to me by the land itself, but this land, there is no connection. This land I cannot speak to, so I do what I can the natural way. Like what I did with you there, and he like points and you like look down and see that like there's like, you know, herby muddy poultices rubbed poultices, yeah. along your wounds and stuff. He was like, if we were in the Fairlands, I could have snapped my finger and created a flower that would heal you instantly. Like, Skogol is just kind of like, not really buying it. And he goes, could magic fix your arm? Magic could replace my arm with a wooden one. I could potentially craft a new one. There, heal what is left. I could create a phantom arm out of energy. If I found the correct wizard, and he like holds kind of like his arm up, and you can see that he's like envisioning his arm where it used to be. If there's no magic here, why stay? It's not an easy journey. We are far into the verdancy, as I said earlier, to make it through the Elder Gloom Forest and over the Diamorth Mountains, through the Dark Dwarven Territory, across the Desert Plains. To Uskashis is not only takes a lot of money, it takes experience. And it's not something I have at my age. Getting here, I exhausted all of my resources. This house, this land, is all I have. Yeah, Skogel kind of stands up and he looks out the window. He looks back and he goes, the land is all anyone has. What you just described is straight ranging. And yet you, in your tiny little form, can't make that distance. He goes, believe me, I wish I could. Without my wing, without my arm, I would have to travel on foot. And I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but I'm not as big as you. Frostclaw, well, Frostclaw's happy here. He has no interest in leaving. Old man, do you want to die here? And he kind of like thinks about it for a second and he goes, It's something that I had accepted long ago. And he goes, speaking of dying, how was it that my friend came to found you on our shores? You were in a gnarly attack or a gnarly scrape. What was it that did that to you? My hunger got the best of me. I I let wolves creep into my periphery and I paid dearly for it. His like big ass owl eyes kind of like sharpen. Did any of them happen to have a scar on its snout by chance running along its eye? You've seen it before? Ah, so it was them. That pack has been a thorn in my side for some time now. They are not ordinary wolves. The Alpha, the one with the scar, is a cunning and ruthless direwolf. I've had more than a few run-ins with them over the years. He like leans back in his chair. And he goes, for as long as I've been here, that pack has attacked anyone they could find. They've made their den and some ancient human ruin not far from here. It's little more than a cave, but ruin treacherous and the pack is formidable. Uh, well, you just found yourself an outlander. His eyes kind of soften, and he goes, Are you willing to take on a dangerous task of removing the wolves from this land? Listen, Alan, I only speak and say things once. I owe you a debt. Well, if that is the case, then there are some items that I might give you in to aid you in your quest. Just a moment. Take here. Orlin gets up and you see him walk over to a nearby chest, which he opens and starts rummaging around. He goes, ah, yes, there it is. Uh, perfect. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Like after a few moments, he closes the chest, comes back, takes a seat, drops the three things onto the little end table. A healing salve, a sturdy rope, and a lantern with oil. The healing salve is a healing potion. It restores 1d8 hit points. Okay. That's cool. And Orlin goes, do you have a map? I hope you're not out here wandering around without one. Frost giants don't need maps. Rangers definitely don't need maps. 
And he just kind of like nods and he shakes his head and he goes, oh, well, let me draw you a little one so I can tell you where they are located. Skogol just like steps backwards. He picks everything up and steps backwards to the door. And he goes, I know what wolves smell like. <sighs> Their cave is a little over a day's travel from here. Now, I know you seem to be ready for blood. I know your kind. But before you leave, I'd like to ask you if you would help Frostclaw with bringing our lumber in. Payment for him bringing you here to save your life. I owe him a debt as well. And he goes. And he just walks out. Thank you. I am much smaller. And <laughs> <laughs> so once you get outside, you can't see the Yeti, but you can easily hear him chopping wood about 100 yards into the forest to your east. Um, yeah, he heads over to, to where he is, the wood getting chopped. Okay. So then, as you get closer, Frostclaw notices you and pauses. The Yeti's piercing blue eyes watch you curiously, and he tilts his head slightly, trying to gauge your intentions. He says, hail, Yeti. Frostclaw blinks, then lets out a low rumbling sound. <laughs> and then kind of like nods at you. I guess he can understand it common. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so he just goes, I've never seen one of your kind before and, and never heard of any kindness of your kind. I owe you a debt. I'm supposed to help you with firewood. He gestures to a nearby axe with his large clawed hand, then points to the trees and finally back to the camp. He's tall for a yeti, you can tell, sitting at just over 11 feet. It's clear to you that he's used to being the biggest thing around. And your presence is... Slightly disconcerting. Ah, don't worry, Yeti. You don't have nothing to fear from me. My kind guess. The Yeti kind of like nods and like puts its hand gently up on its chest, like towards its heart, and then reaches out and grabs its own axe and like dislodges it from the ground. Puts it up, up onto his shoulder. Just kind of lumbers off into the trees to go find a good one to cut down. Uh, and yeah, so he, um, Scoble picks up an axe and starts making work of whatever is left there. Give me that strength check. Give me a DC 15. Oh, that's saving throws, skills. Yeah, so you roll your strength, and then we want to get above a 15 with your buffs. So strength 13 plus what? Three. 16! <laughs> All right. So okay. very yeah. easily over the course of maybe three hours, you managed to cut down several trees without any trouble. With enough trees felled, the Yeti motions to your attention that it's time to haul them back to camp. You already know how heavy the trees are, so go ahead and give me another strength check. A five. Okay, so this one, uh, these are some heavy-ass fucking trees. Like, as strong as you are, you are honestly a little bit humbled when you see how much easier it is for Frostclaw to pick these fucking things up. He slings it up over his shoulder. You are not able to do that. It is literally like... <laughs> as you're like dragging them like through the trees like back over to the thing like your face is beat fucking red but once all of the trees are eventually gathered at the camp outside of Orland's cabin you watch as Frostclaw, Frostclaw starts chopping them into smaller pieces to join them go ahead to join him go ahead and give me another strength check this one a DC 10 so that's a 10 yeah so you are just fucking exhausted from the wolf attack getting sucked under the fucking ice river, chopping wood, chopping trees down all day, and then dragging them back to camp. Like, it's just, it's, you know, your first few swings are off. It takes a while. Like, it's just, you know, you're, you're kind of kind of struggling. After three hours of hard work, the camp is a substantial pile of firewood, almost all of it delivered by fucking Frostclaw the Yeti, but you did put in a good, good amount of help today. Once you finish, Frostclaw gives you an approving nod, and a grunt as Orlin appears in the cabin doorway and says, You did what you said you would, giant. Well done. Thank you. He just chuckles and he's just like, You're not used to speaking to giants, but we always do what we say. He goes, Well, I will remember that in the future. Mm, then, best avoid us in the future. I will remember that as well. It's a daily reminder. <laughs> as he kind of like looks down at his, at his missing arm and wing. He looks, and Skogel notices it more this time. He's he's a little bit more receptive now that he's exhausted. And he just goes, what's the story there? The story here is that I was trying to help someone in need. 
and those of your kind arrived to bring us pain because they thought it would be funny. And I got in the way and was taught a lesson. No more flying for the little birdie. I've been in the same position. I, I can't apologize for my kind because we know we are, but uh, I can apologize for what they did. No. I think it goes without saying. I'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone we are out here. By the way, your kind isn't the most pleasant to small folk. Please and thank you. Alan, um, I was taking a look around your grounds earlier. Um, we could definitely do some things to hide you a little bit better. If this is something you'd like to do once the wolves are dispatched. I'm willing to hear what you have to say. Hmm. I mean, it's your it's your loss either way. It's I mean, it's um it's your death either way. Thank you for your help today, and I hope to see you return. I hope that you're not taking on something too dangerous, and I hope I didn't ask you to do it. And he like takes a sip from his tea and walks back into the cabin. And you're like standing there as like frost claws like. Like chops another fucking thing in half. Yeah, he looks over. Um, he 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 gathers everything that he's got. Um, he looks out over the the compound, looks to Frostclaw, and he goes, "Well met, Yeti. Hopefully, see you soon." The Yeti reaches out a pod hand as a fist bump to be fist bumped by you. He's never experienced this before. Scoble's never experienced a fist bump before, but he's heard about it. So he awkwardly puts his fist forward with probably more strength than he expected go ahead and roll a strength check for me yeah you straight up punch fucking uh uh frost claws hand like fist as hard as you fucking can and he definitely like roar! like pulls his hand back and like shakes and looks at looks at his fist and looks at you like why like but like obviously like doesn't say that and then scoggle and like he has a little anime um blush happening on his cheeks and he's just like i'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry uh next time i'll get it better and then he starts walking off. Rumbles away. And an hour later, Frostclaw stands at the edge of the clearing, watching your teeny tiny form way up on the top of a ridge crest. His eyes follow your every step as you ascend the hill. In his paws, he holds one of the fallen trees. His muscles flex, and with a sharp crack, he splits it down the middle. So what does uh, Skogel think of his first encounter with the two hermits? Well, I mean, he's, he deeply appreciates what he experienced. Um, kindness does not come easy out in the snow. Um, but the simple fact that they were both they were both helpful and both willing to receive in return, it makes him feel something he hasn't felt in a long time, which is a sense of belonging. Orlin Roz approaches Frostclaw, silent in the snow. The two companions stand there for a moment as the icy wind tugs at Orland's feathers as he watches you reach the ridgeline. From approximately 500 yards away, he sees you pause before briefly disappearing over the crest and vanishing from sight. Frostclaw breaks the silence with a melodic, feminine voice that radiates radiates warmth. Is he one of them? Orland responds without hesitation, his tone solemn and knowing. When Indigo from Frost arrives upon the solstice, the fate of the Scourge Garden will be forged in ice and shadow. The weight of Orland's words hang in the air as for a moment before Frostclaw asks, I knew it. Which one is he? Orland's expression turns thoughtful, almost distant. That, my dear, I cannot say. Destroyer, redeemer, betrayer, or sacrifice... The pyramid ever turns. We will find out when time arrives at feet. The Yeti processes the response with a quiet nod, and without further discussion, he turns back to the task at hand. Grabbing another fallen tree, he effortlessly hoists it up and splits the trunk as easily as he did the first. Orlin stands by, watching for a moment longer before turning back to his cabin, sipping the tea with a smile. Time to get back to work. Roll a survival to see how easily you track back to where you killed the caribou.
Okay, very successful. Just over seven hours later. You find yourself standing once more at the edge of the frozen lake where you first brought down the caribou. The memory of the wolves' howls and the desperate chase is still fresh in your mind, but as you, can, but as you scan the area, there are no paw prints in the snow. No sign of wolves. The lake lies silent and still, a sheet of healed, unbroken ice. Roll a perception for me. Okay, 22. So that is going to be... As you pass through the area on your way towards the wolf's den, your attention is suddenly drawn to a distant noise. The rhythmic, steady, and unmistakable ring of axes chopping wood echoes from somewhere beyond the nearby crystal pine tree line. Shouts follow, carried by the wind. As you push through the trees, the sight before you comes into view. A Minotaurian logging crew, hard at work, their axes swinging in unison as they bring down towering frost pines. The logs are being cut and stacked with practiced efficiency, the men moving the coordinated precision of a seasoned team. The men seem to be focused on their work, unaware of your presence. Beyond them, a foreman with massive horns, bigger than all the others, oversees another crew, laying down fresh cobblestones along the old road. You recognize the route immediately. It's the Wayline Road, one of the oldest and most storied roads in the entire region. This ancient route stretches from the towering heights of Mammoth Spire in the giantine north, where the cloud giants dwell among the cloudy peaks, all the way down to the bustling, jewel-like gnomish city of Glimmerbrook, nestled in the southern shores. The sight of the road being maintained is a reminder of the long-stretching power of your race, as mammoth spire banners wave in the breeze atop spikes dug into the frozen earth. Roll a history check for me with advantage, please. Okay. So that is going to be... You know well that the Cloud Cover Kingdom rules these lands. The Cloud Giants rarely descend from their lofty peaks above the clouds. Preferring to remain in their elevated thrones, they look down upon the Scourge Garden like a playground. Instead of ruling directly, they choose to enforce their will through the Torathor Empire, a formidable army of minotaurs hailing from the western coasts. These Turian legions, trained in discipline and bred for battle by the frost giants of old who created them, march across the lands and ensure the kingdom's laws are upheld and its dangers crushed. Your people, the frost giants, though deferential to their taller cloud cousins, have never fully accepted their place beneath the throne of clouds. Fierce and proud, frost giant tribes in the region continue to reave villages with abandon, the glacial concord be damned. Despite the official truce, the frost giants' raids are frequent, surprising, and brutal, leaving little more than devastation in their wake. Their strength and fury are unmatched amongst giant kind and most of them view the Cloud Giant's restraint with disdain. The Glacial Concord was meant to curb those violent tendencies to bring some semblance of order to the fractured realms. Yet the Frost Giants, still driven by the old stories, pay little heed to the agreements made in modern times. In this world, Frost Giant, like ancient Frost Giant arcane wizards, created Minotaurs in this world. So Minotaurs, they are very deferential, very deferential to Frost Giants. It's just that in this world, the Cloud Giants, because they're the most powerful and the most civilized of giant kind, run everything. And the Frost Giants don't really care. Like, they're Reavers, and there's no magic. So, like, they don't have Arcanists anymore. Hmm. Interesting. That's a good little uh, wrinkle. Yeah, so, um, but the thing is, these Minotaurs, while, de- while you know, conceptually deferential, we're, we're not bros. You've never met these people before in your life. The Cloud Giants from Mammoth Spire, up in that top corner, they are, like, basically, like, the runners of, like, the entire Scourge Lands. They wrote the laws, they made the treaties with the dwarves to stop the wars. They, like 
took over the Minotaur Empire and were like, we're going to let you guys do whatever you want and grow your empire out, but you also have to, like, protect the lands and also, like, give us all of the taxes from everybody. And then everyone agreed in all of the Scourge lands to this, except for the fucking Frost Giants. And the Frost Giants were like, fine, y'all can do that, but, like, we're still going to fucking do what the fuck we do, which is, like, fucking take whatever the fuck we want. Okay, cool. And so they're logging, but are, are they... They're, are they built, like, they're, they're like, refurbishing that road. Oh, right, right, right. So, yeah, they're just workers. I mean, I have to cross right here? I mean, you could move further down and cross. I'm, I, this is just something that you have encountered. Got it. All right, he, um, he sees it, and it has nothing to do with his mission to engage them. So he, uh, he wants to get by by moving away and then finding his way across a uh, okay. quieter part. So go ahead and roll a, let's do um, a stealth. Plus what? Plus eight. So that's... Ew, 19. Very right. successful. Okay. The trail leads you deeper into the wilderness through dense forests where the towering frost pines stand like ancient sentinels. The trees close in around you, their snow laden branches creating a labyrinth of white and green. Your breath forms clouds in the cold air as you push forward, each step crunching softly in the snow beneath your feet. Another three hours of relentless trekking, you come upon a towering waterfall completely frozen in time. The water, once a powerful cascade, is now a massive wall of ice, its surface smooth and glass-like. The sunlight filtering through the trees catches the ice at just the right angle, creating a dazzling array of colors that shimmer and sparkle with every step you take. The sight is honestly mesmerizing. Pressing on, the trail begins to climb, leading you up the side of a snow-covered hill. The forest thins out here, and your persistence is finally rewarded. The entrance to the wolf's den comes into view. It's a dark, foreboding opening in the side of the hill, framed by jagged rocks and half buried in snow. The entrance is large enough for several wolves to pass through side by side. Its darkness is a stark contrast to the bright landscape surrounding it. Go ahead and make either a history or perception check for me. Hmm. Honestly, the perception, I, th I feel like the game has been nerfing them, so. Oh, I got a 20. All right, now I'll just try it again. So, okay. success, yeah. Or, yeah, so your keen eyes uh, reveal that this cave is not entirely natural. The rough, jagged edges of the entrance conceal something more. Along the edges of the stone, faint carvings become visible beneath layers of ice and snow. Upon closer inspection, you realize that these carvings form a series of old, intricate runes their meanings long forgotten by most, but unmistakably the work of an ancient hand. Nothing that you can read. So go ahead and either make a survival or a nature check to gather information about the wolves' numbers and behavior. It's going to be DC 12 for survival, DC 14 for nature. Yep, not one. Every time I do one of these new ones. Okay. Uh, the tracks are muddled, uh, overlapping, partially obscured, leaving you pretty uncertain about the exact number of wolves that might be inside. You sense that the pack is pretty significant in size, but you can't be sure of how many there are. Yeah, so upon seeing that he's not quite sure, he feels that it's imperative, knowing how hardcore they wounded him before, to really understand how many there are here. So can you get to a higher vantage to sort of see how all the tracks move around? Absolutely. Go ahead and roll an athletics check for me. Um, yeah, so he, he looks at the walls and he um, tries to understand if he can get a higher purchase. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very easy. These are crystal pine trees are thick with branches. So it would be very easy for you to, even at your, you know, your heavy weight, very easy for you to sort of like climb up pretty high into a visible perch. Go ahead and get it, give me a perception. So let's, we'll get you, 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 you succeed at getting pretty high up into the tree. It's funny. I actually can. I feel like I can hear him moving through space. Like, yeah. Like there's like tinkles. Like he, it's like. Ping, ping. Yeah, that's but awesome. Then, but then, like when he gets to the top, like you, you think it's just like something falling or something, but no, it's a fucking four hundred pound guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like tinkles. All the little pine needles. Wait, you said perception, right? Yeah, perception. At this time of day, because it's, you know, it's gotten pretty dark, honestly. Like, I'd say it's, like, evening. The trees are th so thick that, like, while you are safe up here and concealed, the wolves cannot see you. The, you can't really see them either, though. Uh, not with night sight? It's just, like, the, it's, it's not the darkness. It's how dense the trees are okay. from, from, the, from being up here in this angle. 
I mean, there's really not anywhere to like perch up right outside the cave to see how many there are, just because of how dense the trees are, essentially. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. And that's that's because of that six perception. This fucking ranger is not ranging, bro. Um, <laughs> you ain't ranging right, bitch. Yeah, it's it's like wild. The most important checks he keeps failing. I mean, it's fine. It's, it's good to fuck with this. Um, yeah, I mean, I know where the wolves are. Um, he's not going in without knowing how many there are. So, um, yeah, he's going to he's going to he's going to do observation. He's going to see what he can learn over as much time as it takes for him to learn how many are in there. Okay, so I'm going to say go ahead and roll a survival, and we'll see how he does. And okay, th- very easy for him to just kind of hang out up in that tree and like post up. Roll a nature for me as well. What? Oh, that's a twenty, bro. You fucking. You got that shit. It's uh, Wait, so, okay, all right, so you rolled a nineteen plus one. Oh, when you hover over it, it tells you what the yeah. value is. Yeah. So he, after all of the all of his training stalking prey, um, this is one of the rare times he's actually stalking another hunter, and so he knows he knows that he needs to mask as much as he can. So um, as he's climbing up the trees and he's uh, he's nestling himself high up. He, um, I guess, gathering frost from the tree as he moves up, and he starts painting himself um, in, in, a, in a light layer of hoarfrost. frost. Okay. As he sits there, and, like, the frost sort of hardens across his body over the couple hours that come, and more snow comes down and drifts across his body, he really does kind of just, like, freeze up against the tree. But because he is a frost giant, that is something that he was taught as a child. And it is not something that affects him negatively in any way, shape, or form. So essentially, he can just fucking hug this tree and let it freeze him dormantly against it while he waits and like patiently fucking watches like fucking stealth shadow, like like a ten foot tall dude just like on this fucking tree. And I would say that over the course of roughly the next eight hours, you see that there are seven wolves. Fuck. One me. of one of them is the dire wolf. The well, alpha, um, the he's alpha. glad he waited. And can he see from the seven wolves that he sees? Uh, did he did he witness any like social interaction between them, social hierarchy, anything like that? There's clearly the dire wolf is the alpha, and then the two that you encountered at the lake seem to be the betas, and the rest are all like the pups. So the two oh. that you encountered at the lake was the alpha and his two bitches. Okay, great. So now that he knows that, um, he would. Like but to but when I say pups, I'm they're full grown. Yeah, they're full. They're yeah. just they're just not you know full adults yeah. like full hardcore dire wolves, right? Yeah. So I guess did they go out hunting and then he? No, uh, they're all kind of lounging around. I mean, they drug that caribou back. It's only been so long. Like you can actually see that like the caribou is mostly eaten. I would say that there's probably about like seventeen, eighteen percent left of it. Um, occasionally, one of the like younger, you know, omega wolves will come over and like take a bite off of it, nibble off of it, and like another one will come up and run up and growl at them, and like they'll kind of like run off to like fight and play. But like that's kind of like the vibe that's going on right now. The whole like area underneath your feet just covered in bones of like deer and moose and elk go ahead and roll a perception for me uh yeah so like you see the bones of an elf and you see that uh he was not wearing any armor and that there is a leather satchel partially covered underneath like dirt and snow sort of like near his body but you can't really tell anything else of of value and they're all just kind of hanging out goofing off living their wolf lives yep all right so does he have direct line of sight to them right now not really I mean, he sees them through the trees as okay. they are moving around. Yeah, but he's like, it's like little crystal blue eyes. Like yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a, he's going to wait for them to go back inside, and then he's going to start setting traps. Oh, shit. Okay, so go ahead and roll a d6 for me. So it takes about five more hours. So you're sitting up in that tree for roughly about 13 hours waiting for them to come out, do their thing, and then spread out and kind of head out into the uh, wilderness to go do their hunt as a pack, as they do. When you get down to the ground and stretch your legs and you know get all the creaks out and stuff, what do you do by going about to set these traps? Well, first off, he's gonna make sure that his scent is masked as much as he possibly can. Okay. Uh, and I roll, say- roll, up, roll another nature check for me. Since now that you're out of that tree, okay, that's a success. Since now you're out of that tree, is there anything he does additionally 
in regards to masking his scent. Oh, this is great. Once he's out of the tree, is the caribou still there? What's left of it, yeah. Yeah, so he um, he just covers himself in some of the, the stink and the refuse. So that's awesome. And then uh, he reapplies the frost on top of that. That's that's awesome, dude. All right, um, from here he's gonna start. He's gonna start fucking. Do do we have an impression of how long it's gonna take for them to get back? Uh, roll a nature check for me. Yes, sir. Your best guess is anywhere between three to five hours. Okay. Can we do a roll to find out how many? What the traps I'm going to try and set are, um, they're about injuring and, and, uh, maiming contain. I don't know. Mate, the old maiming contain. Yeah, so the traps he wants to set are maiming and containing. So, um, can we figure out how many he can set? And, and then I'll walk you through where, where I'd like to put them. Sleight of hand would be my get, don't you think? Like, wouldn't that be sleight of hand? Yeah, I think sleight of hand, man. You think sleight of hand? Okay, go for it. Whoa. Okay, so 18, that's a success. So we'll say you can get, like, roll a d4 for me. Well, so that'll, that'll make the, the call. Four. So you can get four traps made in that time. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to trap the carcass. Um, he wants to create a, a springboard trap that when when the carcass is, I guess, manipulated, something will drop on, on, on the, uh, he'll drop a net on one of the wolves. Can, is there some way that I can rig something to um, just drop on the cave entrance? How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because uh, the trees go all the way up to the cave entrance. They do. All right, let's see how I would do this. So this is going to be a, a deadfall trap. He, um, he's going to carve uh, something into the earth and uh, he's going to, it's it's basically just going to be a trigger. It's when someone steps on it, uh, I'd like to rig that tree to just slam down over the cave entrance. Okay, to like crush any that are like entrancing? Yep, uh, it will either crush whoever uh, touches it or, I mean, depending on what happens in the event, it'll block off or at least uh, delay um, any anyone coming from, um, from, from the inside to the outside. Okay. Once the wolves have all entered, I guess that foyer area, I would like to create. Nah, let's just do let's just do simple shit. You know those Vietnam spike tr- spike pits? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, so let's do one of those um, again, triggered by weight. And then for the last one, for the last one, this one will be controlled by me while I'm in the trees. But I'm gonna do um, the uh, the other Vietnam one, which is the the tree log. Okay. It swings towards the cave entrance, but it'll be it'll be over the entire walkway. It'll be okay. Walkway. Okay. Oh, cool. So uh, go ahead and roll um, another. Let's do survival and nature to like get all that done and then get back up into the tree without. Okay. okay so we. Oh yeah. So that's done and done. Okay. So six hours later, the wolves come home and you see that three of them are dragging along an elk. And the others are all kind of like nipping at each other and walking along, getting getting ready. And I'm gonna roll a perception here. So the dire wolf seems to be aware that something is amiss. You're sitting in the tree and you're watching, and all of the winter wolves are, you know, pretty pretty normal. Nothing's really going on. The dire wolf, however, is like walking very slowly around the camp, like sniffing at things, looking at things. Like hasn't walked towards the cave, and one of the smaller winter wolves goes over and like starts nibbling on the uh, caribou thing, and your net like yanks it up, and, like pulls it into the uh, into the air. All the other wolves kind of like scatter at second, and then they like come back to like look to see like why their wolf companion is like trapped, and they're just very very confused. And you watch as like the other wolves are all kind of like jumping up into the air to try to like sort of like nip at the net to free the wolf that's like inside the net that is like freaking out right now. While the dire wolf instead like scare, scans off like into the tree line and like is oh, look, yeah, it's smart. looking around in the trees like something is here. All right, so the spring trap for the the cave entrance is, is uh, it, so none of them ran into the cave once the, the net dropped? They all just wanted, they were like, whoa, let's help him. They like scattered kind of like around, like, but yeah, like a normal animal surprise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like none of them ran all the way into the cave. No. 
And where's that elk body? The elk body that they drug is on the ground, maybe like 10 feet away from the caribou. Uh, so the only direct line of sight I have to anyone is the dire wolf, the elk, and I just know that the... You can hear like, them. They're all yipping. It's very loud. Yeah. But the, the, we're, we're imagining these frost trees to be pretty... pretty um, very dense. Not, not only are the crystal pines, like, thick, the actual pine needles are, like, thick as hell. They're also covered in fucking snow. Okay, yeah. So it's just... It's basically... Wow, this is kind of cool. What a great visual. Yeah, so he's just going to wait... Um, and see what the next move is, like what they do next. Okay. Roll a d4 for me. So it takes four hours for them to stop fucking trying to get that wolf out of the net. The wolf in the net eventually just gets so exhausted that it's just like laying there and all four of its legs are just like dangling through the net holes as its like little face is just like kind of... <sighs> and then like the, uh, the dire wolf has like laid down on its belly, but it's still got... It's, it's very straight backed. Its ears are up. It's still listening. It's still watching everything. And uh, after four hours, you see that... Um, roll another D4 for me. Let's say one wolf has walked, sort of, is walking towards the cave entrance. The others are all kind of just laying around on the ground underneath the net, tired. Wow. They got that fucked up. That's cool. They've been, they've been simultaneous. They've been, like, going back and forth between, like, ripping off pieces of the elk and like trying to free their friend. Okay. Wait, and he never landed a single blow on any of these wolves, right? No, there's been literally, you haven't heard any of them, no. Damn, that's crazy. He literally can't tell how strong they are, but he knows how, how vicious they are. Okay, so yeah, I think I need to look through my skills here because I, I feel like he needs some help. Oh shit. Deft Explorer gives me climbing as fast as walking speed. That's crazy. Yes, um, yes. And that dire wolf is, uh, like, one eye open right now, right? No, it's it's very much alert and watching. It's just not oh, looking okay. up at you, yeah. Oh, I see. You said he laid down, but he, he actually isn't sleeping. He's just no. like, mm-hmm. looking. Okay. So the one that went to the cave didn't trigger that trap? Yes. So as that first wolf walks into uh, the cave, it is absolutely just, like, fucking clobbered. You can't tell if it's dead or... But you hear the like, <laughs> you can't see it from your position, but the trap triggered. The other wolves definitely all sort of like get up at this point. The four that were kind of just like laying around like haphazardly kind of like like wander over towards where that one wolf is. And you can hear them all kind of like whimpering and like making noises and stuff. The dire wolf hasn't fucking budged. Wow. He's that hardcore. That's so cool. Basically, it's all the whelps now, right? It's just the, the little ones. Like it's the big boy? it's there's there's four winter wolves left and a dire wolf left. All right. So there's one more trap that they could trigger. Okay. Um. Yeah. I need I need at least I need to reduce it down to at least as many that I faced before. Hopefully. Okay. Um. So the trap that is the um spike death trap. That one is definitely gonna be a weight trigger. I imagine it's gonna be in front of the cave, but like along the trees so that it's it's about um, capturing them on the way in and out. Knowing where it is, I mean, can I see it from my vantage? I'm assuming yes, because I, I put it there for a reason. Oh yes, you know where it is, of course. All right, so what I wanna do is I want to, I wanna drop out of the tree. I want them to see where I am. I want to goad them into chasing me and then having at least one of them Awesome. As many of as possible. Awesome. Go the trap, and I'm going to save that log for a different situation. I'm going to have these uh, wolves roll perception here just because if they're... Uh, before I do that? It's all going to happen quickly. So okay. I'm just going to have them to see how many of them might fall in. Oh, I see. The trap. So three of them, so you drop down and out of the tree and burst into a sprint. Mm-hmm. Three of them, all, well, all, the dire wolf and all four of them immediately break into a run after you. Mm-hmm. Three of the winter wolves fall into that fucking spike trap. You just hear oh this like. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, one was... of them, one of them easily, he got a 23. One of them fucking leaps over the trap like it was nothing, like as the others fall. And then it like falls into step alongside the dire wolf. Now okay. it's a, now it's initiative. 
one the, the ice wolf goes first dire wolf goes third you go second so the first dire wolf is gonna catch up to you and try to bite you see if we can get past a 16 there, on your is there AC. blocking in in D &D? how's that work? it's I it's guess. like a skill that you can get like barbarians have it but he but that wolf missed you anyways so uh it is now your turn yeah so um the winter wolf is basically right on top of me right now uh yeah but it missed you so it's like nipping at your heels and where am I? Uh, am I in the tree line? Am I on the road? You're on the ground. You're just in the trees because the road is the road's probably like a, a good half mile away at this point. Oh, I, I didn't mean road. I just meant the entrance of the cave. Oh, um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I imagined that you were running away from the cave. Were you running the towards the? Yeah, I, but but were you running towards the cave? Or were you uh, running no, away from the cave? Away. Yeah, okay. because I wanted so, to draw them out. That's what so, I thought. So, yeah, you're on the ground in the snow. Crystal pines all around you. Howling wolves in pain behind you. A winter wolf nipping at your heels directly behind you. And the dire wolf, like, just like yeah. probably about eight feet, six, seven feet. What I think I'm going to do is, knowing that this wolf just missed me, as soon as the, he feels the, the jaws, like, almost clamp into his heel, he takes he keeps running and then he stops and points his spear right into the winter wolf's face okay and that is spear two-handed what does that mean i failed yeah i got a nat one dude i got so Ooh, many buddy yeah okay so the dire wolf attacks there we go that's a fucking 20. that was a nat 20. It no, is. it's a 16 plus 4. Okay, so it's not double damage, but it is extra damage. So with one bite, that dire wolf does 9 damage to you. It, like, gets you a good fucking bite on your leg. Like, hum. Motherfucker, this thing is so hardcore. My, 9 damage. Let me just take that off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All right. He almost got me down to the same fucking hit points he did before. But, yeah, he didn't cripple me or anything like that, right? Nope, nope. Okay. He Where's misses. The... Nice. Okay. So yeah, with the second one missing, uh, my guy is just gonna disengage. Uh, Skogol is going to leap uh, up a tree. Okay. Roll an athletics check for me. Seventeen. That is a success. Once he gets the bite from the big boy, he, he starts rolling on the ground with him in, in a tussle. So while they're rolling, the second one takes a takes a bite, and when it misses, uh, the dire wolf disengages and and Skogol. Um, runs up the tree. Okay. That disengages this initiative because neither of those wolves can get into the tree. So at this point, they are on the ground, snapping, yipping, yelling, barking at you, and like trying to basically like chase after you through the trees, but like they're on the ground. So yeah, let so me it's... let me roll a perception here for these two wolves real quick. See what I got. Let's see if they can follow you. Neither of them are able to follow you. You successfully, like, fucking lose these fucking wolves. Like, you see that they're running around just like the dire wolf and the last remaining winter wolf are just running around, like, chaotically, like, through the trees looking for you. Oh, cool. Um, so now that I'm back in stealth, I'd like to make my way. Well, first, let's heal. How do I do this? <clears throat> well, that would be that healing salve. All right. So, so the healing salve was 1d8. Yep. Um, okay. So, all right. Okay, well, there you go. So you only lost one hit point, really. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, yeah, cool. All right. That's great news. So it's a one and done, though. That thing's gone. Uh, all right. So the wolves that fell into the, the Vietnam death trap, are they dead? Yes. Oh, shit. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to go over to the one that's in the net uh, and draw a bow and uh, basically shoot him to make him yelp. Okay. Roll the bow attack and then roll your damage. You don't. Yep. So then just hit it again for your damage because it's an automatic hit. Okay. So the you shoot it. Where where do you shoot the wolf? Yeah. I mean, I shoot it in a place that will increase its anguish. So is there any? Do I? Can I sense anything that's like sore or like, probably like you know? a like a hip or a thigh or something? Yeah. All right. Just shoot him in the hip. Okay. So yeah, it just immediately starts like howling, like in pain. <laughs> And you hear the dire wolf and the other winter wolf start making like, you know, similar like calls out, but you can't see them. Okay. So I want to put myself in position to uh, anticipate where they'll be so I can do the, the log trap. Go ahead and roll. I would say that's probably going to be, I think stealth. stealth. Yeah, for sure. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, wow. well that's an odd. Yeah. That's a success. 
Yeah, so um, after I after I hit him in Yelp, you know, Scoble has a, a sense of, uh, I guess, determination and grit. The log is going to be coming from behind him okay. as he's facing the cave. And so okay. uh, he just waits for them to get in a position before he, tra- he triggers it. All right, roll a perception for me. He watches as once they sort of like sniff the, the wounded wolf, they see that it's hurt and like they're kind of looking around the area and then they kind of start heading back out into the tree line. Damn. Okay, yeah, he just hangs out there. All right, so go ahead and roll a D4 for me and we'll see how long it takes for... Yeah, so it takes about two hours. Like they are dedicated in finding you. Like they know that you killed a bunch of their fucking family. So like they scour the woods looking for you like trying to actually find you and kill you unsuccessfully it takes two hours for them to come back and when they do come back the dire wolf like it did before immediately plops down on the ground and lays around like looking around out, out of the fucking wilderness the one in the net is not dead it's just fucking wounded and like it's been whimpering for the last two hours from the arrow that you shot it However, the one remaining winter wolf does walk directly up towards you at the fucking uh, cave entrance. It does not see you because you are hidden in stealth mode, but it is walking right up towards you. Oh, great. So, yeah, I'm going to shoot him. Okay. That is a hit. Go ahead and roll that fucking damage. And this thing has 26 hit points, so you've done 11, so it has 15 hit points left. So that is going to be an initiative. Good point. You go first, and then the wolves go. Um, he wants to wait until the dire wolf is within range of the log trap with the winter wolf. And he's well, the to... winter wolf that you shot runs away. It you oh, okay. wounded it, so it's it runs off like a wolf. Okay. So the dire wolf, however, sprints towards you. Perfect. So yeah, I, I'm just gonna wait till he gets close enough, and then I want to spring the trap. And then you said one d12. Yep. Oh, wow, I don't even think I've ever seen this dice. All right, seven. Plus four, so that's 11. So it does 11 damage to this winter wolf, and you watch as the thing like comes down. Or no, the, di- it, the dire wolf. Yeah, it comes down, and it just really hits this thing. But again, this thing is like five feet tall, so it's like the size of a fucking horse almost. Jesus. It, it hits it, and it like definitely like stumbles it off its like charge, and it's like now forcing it. It's being forced to like push itself up off the ground, like wounded, like trying to get back up so it can fight you again, and it just your turn because you paralyzed it and took its turn. All right, well, sorry, buddy. Longbow. That's a fucking hit. And that's 12, so you've done 23 damage, and it is up on its feet. It's going to try to get a bite in on you. So it, it's, mean, just what, out, it's just at the uh, the base of the tree, like trying to like claw up to get up to you, like howling and like growling and like foaming at the mouth. Can I gain an impression of, of whether or not it recognizes me from before? Roll a uh, observation. Uh, no, uh, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say. It's pretty pissed off. Uh, you killed all of its family, so it's kind of focused on that. Yeah, no, it has to die. Longbow. That's a hit. Go ahead and describe how you kill this dire wolf. Um, yeah, so as the wolf is scratching up the tree, um, Scoble thinks to himself that it didn't have to be this way uh, if they just left him alone. But uh, it's the way of the wild, and he shoots him in the face. So, five of the seven wolves are dead. One is wounded and has fled. One is wounded and has been captured. Yeah, Skogol hops down and uh, he mercy kills the one in the net. He just gives him a peaceful, peaceful exit mm-hmm. right behind the back of the neck. Ah! And he he uh, he scans to see if he can see where the wounded. It, can, can you track the wounded one? Yeah, buddy, go ahead and roll a fucking uh, perception. All right, let's do it. Dude, his perception rolls are so bad. You are used to the plains. You grew up on like those icy plains a little up north, and now you're down here ranging in the forest, and it's fucking dense as shit. Okay, yeah. So, um, but are, so, roll. Yeah. So you've got your nature, so you are able to follow the blood trail. Yeah. So he just he just um, he like casually tracks this last wolf down. Roll yeah, a yeah. survival for me on tracking. Yep. Okay. So you find it, and like it's definitely laying by this like portion of a of a frozen river that has like thawed and he's like drinking river from the frozen river like trying to heal himself by drinking water basically yeah so i'll do um a stealth attack and uh just seek to end him 
roll that longbow. Nat one, great, good job, buddy. So the wolf uh, runs off, it, it, it keeps going and it further right. and further away from the cave. So at this point, you think to yourself, do I go after that one wolf or do I go back to the cave? What's more valuable here? Uh, yeah, he'll go back to the cave and just set one final trap for that wolf while he goes inside. Okay. So as you venture deeper into the den, the air gets much colder as you find metal platings running along the walls. They're old and rusted. At first, it's subtle, a piece of metal jutting out from the ice, an odd angle of straight stone that doesn't belong, but soon it becomes undeniable. You notice unusual structures partially buried in the ice and snow, surfaces worn by time, but unmistakably crafted by masterful metal workers. Old support beams, now encased in frost, line the walls. You brush away layers of snow to reveal rusted doors with metal frames twisted and frozen, resisting the passage of time. Strange machinery lies scattered about. Partially dismantled, nothing you recognize. Or simply abandoned. Their purposes unclear, but their clockwork designs unmistakable. You find fragments of old tools, scattered crates, faded markings along the walls. Whatever this place once was long ago, it was alive with activity. Go ahead and roll either a history or an investigation for me. Okay, that's a success. You approach a section of the outpost that feels different, more deliberate in its design, but more guarded. Eventually, you come across a large, reinforced door, half buried in ice and stone. The door, or vault, is marked with strange, intricate symbols. It's clear that this is no ordinary door. It's sealed away from the world. Upon approaching the vault door, you see that it stands tall and imposing, the metal thick and reinforced, designed to withstand the ravages of time and any attempt to force it open. Yeah, he just like to get a perception if he can understand what the purpose of the, the room is. Upon seeing that door in the runes that were in the, the symbols, yeah, he, he's just kind of wanting to see what he, what he can gain access to. So the space that you're in right now seems to have been some sort of like transitory space like this seems to be like like a, a long kind of like hallway like that led out and like maybe there was like parts of the building that are like lost to time but like you have no idea what is behind this vault door you've never seen anything like this before in any of the ruins that you've that you've explored do you reach out to touch the vault or try to open it at all yeah i think for sure okay so the moment your hand touches it a low rumble echoes through the corridor the sound of ancient gears start turning and mechanisms whirring to life fills the air and a sense of foreboding settles over you. Before you can react, the whirring grows louder and the walls of the corridor seem to shift. Hidden compartments slide open with metallic hiss revealing large imposing figures, robotic guards dormant for centuries. Their forms are hulking and angular, built for both strength and durability, with eyes glowing blue as they scan the area. These mechanical sentinels turn their attention to you. Whoa. Roll for initiative. Whoa, they're attacking. Yeah, these things are guardians. They are immediately charging you, and you it's just like... And each of them are coming out from your left and your right. Immediately to your front is the vault. The walls to your left and your right both pulled like clockwork, like to the side. And these things have come out, and they both immediately like charge towards you and like smash their hands down to try to fucking like basically like obliterate you. Go ahead and roll an athletics check to dodge this shit. Oh, well, there you go. Fucking. Welcome to Scoville Wildstone, bitch. First, um, upon the door fucking moving straight up when he touched it, you know, he, he had an impression. Of, of caution that was like heightened at that point. And then as soon as he saw the Sentinels and then realized that their threat was as, it was probably an overwhelming sense of threat. Um, he's never seen moving metal before. No. So it, it, his instinct in that moment is just fucking run. And so when they started running towards him, he was already prepped to, to, to dodge. And so you said they smash their hands down towards him? Yeah, onto the like stone and metal flooring beneath your fate. And like you hear the like, click, 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 like, like echoing throughout the cave, like deafening. 
Okay, yeah, so um, as they slam their hands down, he just realizing there's there's only one way out. He jams his spear into the ground and just like pushes with all of his might back towards the door. And roll an athletics for me. Okay, so with a swift, decisive movement, you turn and sprint back through the corridor, retracing your steps with the cold air biting at your heels. The guardians react immediately, surging forward in pursuit. You can hear their metal. <laughs> Near the entrance to the den, icy air beckons you to safety. One last athletics roll for me. There we go. Oh, there you go. All right, so final burst of speed. You reach the entrance and dive through it. The cold air hits your face like a wall as you emerge out into the open. As you cross the cave's threshold back into the wilderness, both of the robotic guardians stop. Their glowing eyes dim slightly as they watch you from the entrance. Then, with a slow, mechanical, they retreat back into the depths of the mountain returning to the vault hidden deep within. Skogel staggers to a stop, breathing heavily. Honestly, he, he feels a little overwhelmed by what the hell he just witnessed. He's almost wondering if the Allen actually knew what was in that cave or not, because he feels some kind of way about what the fuck he just saw, and it's freaking him out. Uh, he's wondering, was that magic? And then he's like looking around at the carnage that he wrought. Now, I guess he walks over to the dire wolf, and he kind of like, holds the mighty head like towards him um with a scar what a strange bed you've made for yourself <laughs>